There's a significant population of people who focus their attention on preventing and reversing age-related decline. You may be one of them. Well, I'm not here to promise you everlasting life of a vampire, but I am here to show you what researchers have called the power of three. It sounds pretty ominous, especially when I say it like this. The power of three. But it isn't referencing anything sinister like Voldemort's bones of the father, flesh from the servant, and blood from your enemies. Bone of the father, unwillingly given. It's far more tame. It's a supplement stack, and a cheap one at that. Not only that, this supplement stack has been shown in exciting preliminary studies to reverse not just some, but many of our age-related dilapidations. So, what is the power of three? What science is there behind it? What does it specifically do to reverse many aspects of aging? The power of three was coined by a group of researchers that spearheaded much of the research related to two supplements, two of the three named. One of the supplements is glycine, and the second is N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. And the third isn't a supplement, it's a protein. You see, when we age, one of the major concerns that permeates across every cell of our body is the slow buildup of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the imbalance of destructive molecules known as reactive oxygen species, ROS for short. Normally, your cells use a wide array of antioxidants, molecules that neutralize ROS, thereby keeping oxidative stress in check. However, when we age, there's a reduction in our antioxidant capacity because our cells produce less antioxidant molecules or produce more ROS. Ultimately, if there are too many ROS, your cells are undergoing oxidative stress, which means that these molecules, molecularly unsatisfied as they are, cause damage to functional sections of the cell, like functional proteins. Think enzymes and functional lipids, fats. Think uh, the cell membrane or mitochondrial membrane. Obviously, if you start destroying everything in your cells, they suffer. I suppose I don't need to spell that out, and that's a good thing. But me not spelling it out, not the destruction of your cellular innards. Uh, because I have a lot to show you, and we haven't even gotten started. So, as we, I mean you, because I live in blissful denial as my knees creak ever more loudly with every passing day. So, as you age, your cells have reduced levels of a key antioxidant protein called glutathione. So, glutathione is normally produced by your cells through... A series of enzymatic reactions, but we'll focus on one enzyme, glutathione synthase. So the other enzymes and glutathione synthase attach to amino acids and stitch them together in such a way that they produce the antioxidant protein glutathione. Guess what the amino acids are that make up glutathione? That's right. Although you probably didn't say anything, I could sense where your mind went. The amino acids are glycine and cysteine, the two that you'd be supplementing with. This supplementation presumably increases available substrate for these glutathione-producing enzymes to interact with and produce more glutathione. But you know what? Don't take my word for it. Let's crack open some studies and sink our teeth into it. I read and analyzed three studies on the topics, some in animals, but the majority in humans. And here's what happened when people supplemented with glycine and NAC, shortened as glynac. Over 16 weeks of supplementation, people experienced significant increases in glutathione, as evidenced here. All you need to know is the darker the smudge, the more protein is there. In this case, glutathione. Or, if you prefer, we can look at the graphs, which indicate the exact same thing, just, well, in graph form. Clearly, if you look at the pre-supplementation values and compare against the 16-week values, there's a huge increase in glutathione. Even more exciting is the comparison versus much younger individuals, with presumably maxed out levels of glutathione. See the comparison? They're the same. So Glynac supplementation recovered glutathione levels to youthful levels. Okay, okay, okay. So 
that's still a bunch of background, but what you actually want to know is the functional effects that supplementation has. I mean, it's great that I tell you that glutathione increased, but what about measures like insulin resistance, inflammation, heart health, and so on? Well, look, if you just give me a few more minutes of your time, I'd like to keep us in your cells because I'd like to first address some of the effects on mitochondria and fat burning. Then I promise that we'll look at some of these other health measures. All right, you probably know the organelle mitochondria, and yes, it's the powerhouse of the cell, but it's also the site of your oxidative stress because mitochondria produce oxidative stress, not because of malicious reasons. It serves a function to produce reactive oxygen species, but as we discussed earlier, too much can lead to oxidative stress and damage. Well, we can measure the activity and health of mitochondria by measuring their fat burning potential. Essentially, fat molecules fed to mitochondria are oxidized or broken down and used for energy. So the higher the value, the greater the mitochondrial fat breakdown. So if we compare the values of the young individuals versus the older individuals before supplementing, you can see that fat burning potential of these mitochondria is lower in the older individuals. Yet after supplementation, the mitochondrial capacity to burn fat rebounds back to healthy young levels. That is pretty wicked. Additionally, we see that the proteins involved in the breakdown of fat into energy in the mitochondria are also substantially increased after supplementation, like those involved in the gateway into the mitochondria, as well as those involved in the actual energy production produced from these fats. Beyond that, a master protein for mitochondrial biogenesis, meaning mitochondrial renewal, birth, is also significantly elevated. That said, this is still not a perfect proof of better overall mitochondrial health, but it certainly pushes the narrative that way. Okay, okay. <laughs> I've held you in the cell long enough, but I can't help myself. It'd be a shame to just examine the overall effects and not understand even some of the mechanisms. And there are many more. I have content on all of that, but I'll introduce you to that later. So what happens to our more relatable markers of health? Well, in measures of insulin resistance, supplementation did not help in regulating blood sugar levels. But before you scold me for leading you down a path of expectation to just disappoint, if we look at the insulin levels, they dropped over 60% over 16 weeks. So, to maintain the same blood sugar levels, it required less than half the insulin, which means people became substantially more insulin sensitive because it requires the body less insulin to maintain the same amount of blood sugar. That's pretty rad. Is rad still a word? Are the youth using it still? That's so fetch. Okay, let's... How about heart health? In measures of blood pressure, the effects were more modest. Specifically, there was an improvement in systolic blood pressure, but no change in diastolic blood pressure. But you also have to consider that these individuals weren't exactly massively unhealthy. Their blood pressure was a little bit higher in systolic and brought into a normal range, and their diastolic was already in a pretty normal range. Plus, it's possible that the analysis just didn't have enough statistical power to pick up on subtle differences. But regardless, the effects are mild. Yet, on measures of endothelial health, so that's markers of blood vessel function, uh, there were significant improvements. So, all in all, I'd still argue that the effects are mild, but they're still present and might be more effective in people with higher blood pressure. But that's to be assessed. So far, so good. But how about measures of inflammation? Oh, this is good. Measures of interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and C-reactive protein, which are all inflammatory markers, all reduced, but didn't just reduce, but were brought down to near youthful levels. So 70-year-olds supplementing with Glynac experience inflammatory levels near 20-year-old levels. That's remarkable. Maybe you really don't need to be a vampire to reverse aging. All of those results were also corroborated in this study, 
So this isn't isolated to one study. So at this point, I've covered about 5% of the data that I covered in my detailed analysis, which spans from discussing actual life extension effects to autophagy to brain health and much more. But I should warn of two things. One, that while we have good evidence these positive anti-aging effects are related to glutathione content, it isn't foolproof. We would need more data on that, specifically animal knockout experiments, meaning animals unable to generate glutathione to see if supplementation really does become inert as a result. Second, one of the studies did indicate elevated alkaline phosphatase, ALP, which can be a sign of liver injury and tissue calcification, as well as a few other potential reasons for elevation. The researchers did use other measures of liver health, and these did not indicate anything was wrong. But they did not perform any other tests on bone and kidney. So the elevated ALP is a mystery at this point. Still, it's one area, along with long-term use, that we need more data to determine the effects in Glynac supplementers. Additionally, dosing and timing of dosing depends on your age, because a 20-year-old, according to these metrics, doesn't need to be supplementing. It'd be a waste of your money. Yet someone older would likely reap some significant benefits. But without further ado, if you want to know far more details, including the aforementioned mechanisms on Glynac and anti-aging, I'll link my detailed analysis on the topic. And otherwise, I'd highly recommend some of my other content. Speak with you soon. Thank you.